first, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. You're through to reception at the Island Hotel in Crete. How may I help you today? Yes, hello there. I'm hoping to book a double room for my wife and myself for about two weeks from the 25th of April of this year. Firstly, could you tell me whether it's particularly hot during this time? Yes, of course, sir. During late April and early May, the daytime temperature shouldn't exceed 19 degrees Celsius. But the weather has been rather erratic and difficult to predict in recent years, so I am unable to say for certain. OK, that sounds good. My wife doesn't like going outside when it's very hot. I haven't booked flights yet but I must say that I'm unfamiliar with Crete and its transport system. Does the hotel provide an airport shuttle service? Yes, sir. We provide a complimentary airport pickup service for all our guests. It takes about 40 minutes to get here from the airport, but it's at least 60 minutes at rush hours, and you will be provided with a fully air-conditioned shuttle bus. OK, excellent. In that case, do you have any rooms available for the dates I gave you? I shall have a look on the system now for you, sir. Bear with me just a moment. Yes, sir. I can see now that we have several rooms available. Would you prefer a garden view or a sea view? Well, ideally, I would like a sea view room with a balcony. But of course, that depends on the difference in price. Not to worry, sir. All of our standard double rooms have ensuite facilities and a balcony. If you would like one of our sea view rooms, there is a premium of 60 euros per night. OK. So could you tell me the total nightly rate for a standard double room with a sea view? Yes, of course, sir. For the spring months, our rate is 216 euros per night. For 14 nights altogether, this will come to 3,024 euros. Perfect. I also read on your website that the hotel has gym and spa facilities. Are there any other facilities on offer? Yes, we have a large outdoor infinity pool overlooking the ocean with luxury sunbeds and a poolside bar. We also have three full-size tennis courts where we run a popular doubles tournament with the winner receiving two all-inclusive spa day vouchers. Goodness, I shall have to brush up on my tennis skills. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Are there any other activities organised by the hotel that we can partake in? It's just that it's our wedding anniversary on the 30th of June, and I would like to provide my wife with a perfect romantic getaway. I can assure you, sir, that your wife won't be disappointed. Ours is a five-star resort, which is renowned for its luxury and beauty. In terms of activities, the hotel provides thrice-weekly entertainment. On Tuesdays, Guests will take a minibus and partake in learning to cook succulent fish dishes with our Michelin-starred chef, Enrique. The class will take place in a beautiful valley deep in the Cretan Hills, where guests will be treated to an intimate piano performance by our in-house concert pianist, Pedro. On Wednesdays, a select number of guests will be fortunate enough to explore the mountains by helicopter before being transported 
to a tropical Cretan garden by shuttle bus. Finally, on Thursdays, after a fancy dinner, we provide a spectacular fireworks display, which guests can view from the comfort of a cable car. Oh, wow! That all sounds absolutely wonderful. I shall book the room now, and then I need to look at flights so as not to become extortionate. Would you like to take my details now or later? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a podcast on Camber's theme park. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to Canvas Park Podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Canvas offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Canvas also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors. Not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel. Set in 80 acres of beautiful countryside, about three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulchester. The park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers has over 45 different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about £8 per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to 50% off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the Offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, and we're particularly proud of our Future Farm Zone, which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round, 
and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5, just half an hour before closing time. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behaviour and capabilities, but here at the park we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience and feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment, from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide. Whiz down the polished vertical slide nine meters in height and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go-Kart Stadium with 16 carts, 8 for single drivers and 8 for kids preferring to ride along with mum, dad or carer. Take part in high-speed races in our specially designed Formula One style carts but no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 metres because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.canvaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Canvas Theme Park. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a professor and a student talking about taking a course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Excuse me, Dr. Twain. May I speak with you for a minute? Of course, please come in. I'm Charlotte York. I'm considering taking your course in tourism. Right. Well, Charlotte, how can I help you? I have been considering studying tourism. However, it is such an important decision that I would like to seek some advice about it first. Would you mind answering some of my questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Well, I have been discussing courses with my parents and they are concerned that I will not be able to get a well-paid job with a degree in tourism. The reason that I want to study the course is that I have a great interest in the subject and I think I would really enjoy it. I believe the only way that I will enjoy my life is if I enjoy my career. Happiness is far more important than money, don't you think? Absolutely. I would much rather be happy and poor rather than rich and miserable. Money cannot buy you happiness. I'm glad you agree. You needn't worry about money, Charlotte. A large part of the tourism course is dedicated to teaching students how to manage finances, a skill that you can apply to your everyday life as well. I would also recommend that you take a sideline course in time management, as this can be incredibly useful in efficiently planning your workload. Efficiency is the key to success. I'll remember that. Now, I have found that some students have natural talents that really help them to succeed in the course. Communication skills, for example, can be very beneficial. Do you have any strengths? Maths was always my favourite subject at school, so I really enjoy solving mathematical problems. However, I find statistics quite difficult. I have always been very capable and self-sufficient. I have a lot of confidence in my abilities and will take the initiative in situations without needing to depend on anyone else for their help. That's a really great quality to have and will be particularly useful if you choose to study tourism. That's great. I would recommend that you spend some of your time researching the course. A lot of people who are uneducated on the subject claim that tourism is a shrinking industry and that it will become irrelevant in the future. If you study the published research, however, you will see that the truth is quite the opposite. The industry has, in fact, grown significantly as people have developed an ever-increasing interest in culture and travel. Have you compared the university course with a polytechnic? Yes, I have. I was interested in studying the course in modules. However, the university doesn't offer that option. I don't have enough funds to be able to attend an expensive university, so I was relieved to see that the course is quite affordable. I also considered attending a summer school instead of university to save money and so that I could work during the rest of the year. But I really wanted the university experience. I think that university would suit you well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, what about the courses? Are you interested in any of the other subjects on offer? I have looked at a few. I was interested in travel and business as it sounds similar to tourism. That is really worth learning. However, be aware that it is difficult and will demand a lot of your time. OK, that's good to know. You might find that Japanese is an interesting course and it will teach you valuable skills in speaking the language. Personally, it's not bad and could be of some help, but not that much. OK, Japanese. Got that. What about medical care? Well, if you have time, the course will teach you a lot about curing diseases and illnesses or dealing with injuries outside. 
although it's not essential. So, okay, if it's useful, I'll take it. If you enjoy using technology and are worried about fulfilling the entry requirements, computing is very relaxed about the skills that applicants must possess. I'm terrible with computers, so I'm not sure that I would enjoy that course. How about public relations? Yes, I would recommend that course. It would be related to entering the tourism industry, as it will educate you on how to approach clients and develop associations with them. That's great. Thank you so much for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a place called Kuba Pedi. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Good afternoon. Today we're continuing this series of talks on the development of the Australian outback with a look at Cooper Pedy, the desert town of opal mines and underground living, which lies eight hundred and sixty kilometres north of Adelaide and six hundred and ninety south of Alice Springs. The inaccessibility. Harsh climate and almost total lack of water made it a highly unlikely place for human habitation, but that all started to change in 1915 with the discovery there of opals, the precious stones which seem to change colour according to their surroundings. Settlements were established following the First World War, when soldiers returning from the trenches of France brought with them. The techniques of living below ground in dugouts, the depression of the 1920s and 30s, led to many prospectors leaving, but the town boomed again in the late 1940s, when shallow new opal fields were discovered, and immigrants from Europe arrived in large numbers after the Second World War. It must be remembered, though, just how hostile conditions were. Daytime summer temperatures reached well over fifty degrees centigrade. Winter nights were bitterly cold, and dense dust storms regularly blanketed the town. To cope with this, more and more people began living in disused mines and purpose-built subterranean houses, where the temperature remains at a comfortable twenty-five degrees all year round. So that eventually. Around seventy percent of the town's inhabitants had made their homes beneath the surface. This led to the construction of hotels and even churches below ground, as well as an entire underground shopping centre, the only one in the world. Now answer questions thirty-seven to forty. Perhaps not surprisingly, 
This has now led to the emergence of a secondary industry, tourism. Increasing numbers of visitors come to see the tunnels and the caves with their ventilation shafts, the weird machines lying about in the town, and just beyond it in the scorched red desert, the conical hills thrown up by the world's biggest opal mines. It's a logical stopping place for travellers too. The nearest town to Cooperpedi is Woomera, in the prohibited area once used for launching space rockets. But even that is an enormous distance away. Within the town itself, there are plenty of hotel rooms and a number of ethnic restaurants. Remember that Cooperpedi is one of the most multicultural places in Australia, with an estimated 45 nationalities represented and its very own Opal Museum. A short distance from town, there's a section of the enormous barrier that runs thousands of kilometres across the country. The Dingo Fence, which is meant to keep these predatory wild dogs out of the sheep farming areas. Another attraction just outside town are the sets of various films made there, including Mad Max 3, as well as The Red Planet, and Until the End of the World, names that reflect the harshness of the terrain and temperatures there. The name Kuba Pedi, incidentally, comes from an Aboriginal expression meaning white man's hole in the ground. Next, I'd like to go on to talk about Broken Hill, another mining town, but one that... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.